So the Euthyphro is a nice dialogue for illustrating uh, what we can think of as the Socratic method, or uh, what Socrates was up to a lot of the time when he was doing the things that Socrates did. And that gives us an opportunity to talk about the Socratic method. And in fact, there's no such thing as the Socratic method. It's like a complicated, not complicated, it's a confusing term because it gets used for three different things somehow. So properly speaking, if there's such thing as like the Socratic method, like the method of so philosophy that Socrates took himself to be practicing uh, kind of self-consciously, what he took himself to be doing philosophically speaking, uh, to the extent he had any special sort of method, it's probably what we would call uh, meiotics. So that's a Greek word for midwifery or midwifing, uh, you know, bringing a baby into the world. And so what Socrates took himself to be doing sometimes and what he's sort of not doing in the Euthyphro, so he's not illustrating meiotics here, uh, is a method of sort of uh, bringing someone to knowledge by uh, kind of getting them to come to the knowledge themselves. So the most famous example of this is in the dialogue the Mino, where uh, he teaches geometry to a slave not by um, like lecturing at a slave in geometry, but just by you know drawing pictures and asking the slave questions about the pictures. And then the slave works out the geometry themselves. And so the thought is Socrates isn't like imparting any knowledge to the slave. Socrates isn't doing this himself. He's just sort of helping the slave along as the slave discovers that he already knows this sort of thing. And so uh, this is meiotics in the sense that the midwife isn't like giving birth to the baby or something. The midwife is just helping the baby uh, along. It's the mother who's giving birth to the baby. So that is the sort of biggest special Socratic method to the extent Socrates is doing anything interesting. That's an interesting thing. We're not reading the Mino, and he's not doing it here. But I mention it because when you talk about like the Socratic method of philosophy, like what makes Socrates a special philosopher, uh, probably it would be meiotics, which, so <laughs> keep that in mind, and that is not what's going on in the Euthyphro. The other thing, another thing you can think of as the Socratic method is basically being kind of a jerk to people, which is what he's doing in the Euthyphro. So you'll notice um, really like on the second page almost, uh, no, the third page, yeah. So by the third page of this dialogue, Socrates is just really going hard at Euthyphro being like, what are you talking about? You say you're doing this thing for reasons that I don't understand. Please, please explain these reasons to me more. And as Euthyphro tries to explain his reasons, Socrates keeps asking questions and questions, and they sort of make it clear that Euthyphro basically has no idea what he is talking about. Uh, and Socrates isn't in any better position, at least he claims not to be in any better position. And so I call this being a jerk, because this is like rude to go up to somebody on the street um, Although, I guess in this case, Euthyphro starts the conversation, but often Socrates starts the conversation and just like really quickly makes the person look ignorant. And why is that rude? Well, it's uh, like he's often doing this in front of a crowd. So Plato and other people who are sort of students of Socrates uh, liked to see this happen and would follow Socrates around as he would like uh, come up and start asking prominent people very pointed questions, which end up reducing the prominent person to a state where it was clear they didn't really know what they were talking about. So that's, I don't know, that's not very nice, but Socrates appeared to have done this. Uh, I have in parentheses gadfly, so the way Socrates characterizes this uh, in the Apology is that he's being a gadfly. He's sort of, and a, a gadfly is a fly that's sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, biting, I guess, um, a cow or a bull and uh, or horses. I don't know. They go after livestock. And uh, the thought is the gadfly sort of uh, wakes you up and it makes you swat your tail at them and stuff like that. And so Socrates takes himself to be kind of awaking people from uh, dogmatic slumber. Like Euthyphro goes along thinking he knows what is pious. And Socrates comes along and says, hey, slow down. Is it? Do you really know what's going on? And so he takes this to be a kind of helpful thing. And uh, Lots of philosophers 
maybe most philosophers tend to like go along with him and say, yeah, this is a useful thing. If you don't think this is a useful sort of thing, probably you won't be very inclined to philosophy. Philosophy is kind of this process writ large. Like when you read philosophy, it's kind of asking you all these questions and you're realizing that maybe you didn't know as much as you thought you knew, at least if you're reading it right. Um, and so uh, I think philosophers tend to be relatively uh, accepting towards uh, Socrates's behavior, but uh, I don't know, I, you don't want to lose sight of the fact that this is kind of socially very uh, rude. And so that kind of Socratic method is interesting. Uh, I would not recommend trying it on people. The third is probably the most common usage of the term the Socratic method. It gets used as like a term in education. Uh, so lots of teachers, not philosophers, but uh, lots of teachers uh, will say like, oh, I teach my students with the Socratic method or something. And what they seem to have in mind there is like asking questions um, to prompt students to think about things. And so notice that has features of maybe both of the first two Socratic methods. So in the Maeutics, the way Socrates would sort of get somebody to realize that they already know something or get somebody to figure something out themselves is largely through questions. The second thing, the being a jerk, being a gadfly, that occurs through like questioning. And so, uh, yeah, I guess like teaching by ha like asking students questions um, is like sort of involves the one or both of the Socratic things. But like often when teachers say they use the Socratic method, they don't mean I like exclusively ask the students questions. I, I sort of just prompt them questions. What they mean is like, oh, I ask them questions and other stuff too, and it becomes a whole dialogue and we go back and forth and it's like a discussion. I mean, yeah, so that like, that's just like talking and stuff. So really it shouldn't even be questioning here. It should just say discussion. So, you know, in contemporary education pedagogy, a lot of people use the Socratic method to mean just like discussion. Uh, so that's great. I mean, of course, we're doing that Socratic method in this class all the time outside of these lectures. Uh, every day we have discussions in our class, so we're doing that. But um, don't, I mention this just because, number one, it is the most common usage of the term the Socratic method in English today, I think. And number two, it has nothing at all to do with Socrates. So, <laughs> uh, great. Now, getting to the Euthyphro itself. So the topic of this uh, dialogue is what is piety and you're going to get a big dose of what is piety and you might say well I don't believe in the gods uh, I don't care about piety so this is a waste of time I don't need to know what piety is one way or the other because there are no gods so problem solved so you know fair enough I think the dialogue is still interesting even if you don't believe in any gods but whatever uh, this dialogue is still relevant even if you don't care about piety because uh, the way this idea in the Euthyphro developed quite a bit in later philosophy is that uh, it turned into less of a question about piety and more of a question about goodness. So the central question about piety that we're asking in the Euthyphro is, um, is certain behavior pious because it's valued by the gods? Or do the gods value certain behavior because it's pious? So that's going to be the dialogue. And you can ask a very similar question about goodness uh, in, a in a variety of contexts. Uh, the easiest context to think about is, again, like a godly context. So you can imagine uh, you have like an all-powerful god in charge of the universe. And uh, you might ask, well, is, uh, let, let's say it's wrong to murder people. And so this says goodness, but it could also be badness. So let's say it's bad to murder or it's wrong to murder. And so the question is, well, is it wrong to murder because God tells you not to murder? So God has a rule, don't murder people. And so that makes it wrong. Or did God make the rule, don't murder people because it's wrong to murder people? So that's why God put the rule there. So does goodness and badness depend on God? Or does God look at what is good and bad and then make the rules based on that? And so this is Again, a God-centric question, but you can ask this not just about God, but about sort of any source of goodness. And so the way the Euthyphro question developed in the centuries after Plato was 
mostly people stopped talking about piety and started saying like, well, let's just imagine the dialogue was about good and bad rather than pious and not pious because uh, being pious is maybe less of a concern these days, although certainly people still care quite a bit about what is pious or not pious. But uh, even if you do not care about piety, there's still something in this dialogue for you.